I know it's here somewhere. Finally, finally. Oh, it's time for the duck. You're listening to Dr. Bill, the computer curmudgeon. Ah, oh, take it away, doctor. Well, it's that time again, and the doctor is in. It's time for another Dr. Bill, the computer curmudgeon netcast. And this week we have stuff. We always have stuff. But this stuff is very techy and cool. And I like that in a stuff. Ha <laughs> ha! Anyway, we are proud members of the Tech Podcast Network, techpodcast.com. If it's tech, it's right here on Dr. Bill the Computer Curmudgeon and all the great netcast, podcast, audio, video, and so on that are on Tech Podcast Network. Good stuff. You ought to go check it out techpodcast.com. Yes. Okay, let's talk about the stuff that I mentioned earlier. First of all, we find that I'm looking at the wrong article. <laughs> I went back too far on the blog. The blog, of course, being Dr. Bill, the computer curmudgeon, D-R-B-I-L-L dot C-C, as it says right there, the computer curmudgeon. C-C stands for computer curmudgeon. You knew that. Just checking, making sure you knew. Okay. First item, new Linux kernel 3.3 is out. Now that's good, but here's the interesting part. It contains Android code. Hmm, I find that interesting. As a matter of fact, I said in the article, I find that interesting. <laughs> Isn't that redundant? Anyway, the article says that the latest kernel update for Linux has been released. The features supporting Android are back for the first time since 2010, along with improved processor and networking support. For a long time, the code from the Android project has not been merged back to the Linux repositories due to disagreement between developers for both projects. The release notes state, fortunately, after several years, the differences are being ironed out. Various Android subsystems and features have already been merged, and more will follow in the future. This will make things easier for everybody, including the Android mod community, or Linux distributions that want to support Android programs. Dude! So, there's synergy going on amongst the Linux and Android development communities, which is good for us as consumers. Yes. The Linux team has been looking at reintroducing Android since December after the acrimonious split in 2010. After the last kernel, kernel, kernel summit in Prague, Tim Page set up the Android mainlining project and called for developers uh, and called for developers. Period. <laughs> the new kernel features have focused on putting enough code in to allow smooth cross-platform development and interoperability between Linux and the current version of Android. Yes. So, good stuff. Hopefully, we'll have more Angry Birds. <laughs> I'll talk about that in a bit. Wouldn't that be fun? Angry Birds on Linux. Yes. You see my angry bird back there? And of course the pig, he's he's kind of hiding behind the, the chair there. Anyway. So, next item. Microsoft plans to wrap up Windows 8 development in summer with a release in October. I'm, I'm warming somewhat to Windows 8. Although, if you trace the timeline of Microsoft operating systems and you do the skip of good and bad operating systems, you know, for instance, you had Windows XP, then you had Vista, which was bad, then you had 7, which is good. So that might mean that 8's gonna be bad. But, they're trying, they're trying to make it good. We'll see. We'll see if they pull it off. The beta, I was, yeah, I liked it. I was somewhat impressed with it. You know, the fact that, Yes, they had the tiliness and the metroiness, but they also had a way to get to the regular desktop. Yeah, and there were certain features that I did like that I saw. So you know, well, yeah, 
I'll reserve judgment until the final product comes out. Yes, that would be the best thing to do. Now, let me mention that we have an awesome sponsor in Citrix Systems. Citrix Systems has a product called GoToMeeting with HD Faces. Now, HD Faces is a concept whereby if you have an HD webcam, you can talk to one another across the interwebs with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio HD quality video feature. So GoToMeeting now has that feature with HD Faces. And it's really cool because you can not only see each other and talk to each other and collaborate, but you can also see uh, desktop, you know, sharing as you talk, uh, which means you can collaborate even easier with various projects. Uh, you can put up, you know, PowerPoint slides. You can do all kinds of things in your meeting. And you don't have to go traveling all over the place to have a meeting. So that's cool. So anyway, check out the special URL here, the bit.ly URL, which will give you a special 30-day free deal. If you go to that bit.ly URL, click through it, you will get that deal, and that is awesome. So take advantage of it. It's a good thing. Okay. Next item. Apple's new iPad is hot, hot, hot. <laughs> you remember the old song? <laughs> it's hot, hot, hot. Well, the iPad really truly is hot, as it turns out. Users are complaining, and Apple, as usual, when users complain, are going... <laughs> They're not thrilled with their users complaining. So, and they're being a little snotty about it, if you understand my drift there. So anyway, it's not uncommon for Apple enthusiasts to start finding fault with their new gadget within a couple of days of buying the latest and greatest. In some rare cases, most famously with the iPhone 4 antenna, Apple may end up acknowledging some validity to the griping. Usually they don't. But for now, at least, that's not what's happening when it comes to reports that the new iPad kicks out more heat than its predecessors. It turns out that particularly when you play games on the new iPad, it gets really, really hot. As in, almost too hot to handle. Which is kind of bad. But, you know, it has a more powerful processor, and games tend to exercise the processor greatly. And so it makes sense. If it's going to get hot, that's when it's going to get hot. But anyway, we'll see what happens. I suspect there'll be a third-party market of fan doohickeys to go on the back of your iPad to cool them off. Or maybe to blow the hot air elsewhere. Or something. Or maybe even really amazing coolers that cool it down to where it can double its power. Ha <laughs> ha! or something crazy like that. You know the third party market will try to come up with cool stuff. We'll just see how that works. Okay, next item, Seagate announces a drive size breakthrough. Now, I liked this. I had an interesting comment from somebody on this article that basically said, do you really trust a 60, is it 60? I'm looking at the article. Yes, 60 terabyte hard drive. Think about that. Not a 60 gig hard drive, no. A 60 terabyte hard drive. Now the person who made the comment on the, uh, on the article here said, you know, I don't know if I'm going to trust a drive that's that big because if you have that much data out there and you lose it, you have lost a lot of data. And my comment was, well, you got to do backups, dude. But a 60 terabyte drive I could really get behind that. I mean, it would be as close as you could come to having infinite storage. I know some of you are saying 60 terabytes is not infinite. I could fill that up with just my videos. <laughs> Maybe. But you must have some collection for 60 terabytes. My goodness. There's whole corporations that don't have 60 terabytes of data. <laughs> anyway, Seagate has demonstrated the first terabyte per square inch hard drive. Almost doubling the aerial, aerial density found in modern hard drives. Initially, this will result in 6 terabyte 3.5 inch desktop drives and 2 terabyte 2.5 inch laptop drives, but eventually Seagate is promising up to 60 and 20 terabytes respectively. Dude! 
60 terabytes in a drive. That's just amazing. So, you know, we'll see. I, you know, I'm an early adopter. I tend to like these kinds of things when they're all <laughs> modern, fresh, cutting edge. I know what some people say. Cutting edge means you bleed a lot. <laughs> well, maybe. But anyway. Next item. This item is so... <laughs> It's so near and dear to my heart, as I mentioned earlier. Angry birds in space. <laughs> Gotta love that. As somebody at work pointed out, does that mean the pigs are in space? <laughs> yes. Pigs in space. Cool. Anyway, here's what I say about it in the article. Angry birds, space, what more do you need? That appears to be the shared sentiment around the world, as Angry Bird space is soaring to new heights. Indeed, I must have it. And in fact, I got it for my droid Android phone. So I can sit there with my phone and play Angry Birds in space. Ha <laughs> ha! Yes. I got the free version, though. I'm cheap. But anyway. But notice what it says here. Only a few hours after its debut... Rovio's Angry Bird Space has hit the top of the App Store charts in more than 28 countries. Released last night at 1 a.m. Pacific Standard Time or 10 a.m. Helsinki Time, Angry Bird Space costs 99 cents on the iPhone and $2.99 on the iPad. The game, which was highly anticipated thanks to a smart marketing campaign by Rovio that included a video from NASA, actually filmed in space, and a promotional campaign with Walmart, is the number one paid and number one top grossing app in dozens of countries, including the US, China, Germany, France, Indonesia, New, New Zealand, Russia, Colombia, Denmark, Norway, Mexico, India, Greece, Belgium, the UK, Spain, and no surprise, Finland, Rovio's home base. In Japan, Taiwan, Switzerland, and Korea, Angry Bird Space is the number one paid iPhone and iPad app. Dude! I mean, this thing has taken off to amazing proportions. Now, you know my son, the Game Master, is he's in a program at uh, High Point University where he's learning to, to create games and, and majoring in games, which I find interesting. I mean, you know, majoring in games. Who would have thunk it, you know, years ago? At any rate, so being helpful... I suggested to him, I've got an idea for a game. You could call it, uh, let's see, what was it? I'm trying to remember the start. What it, the, what was I going to call it? Pugnacious Pigs, I think it was. Was it Pugnacious? I don't think it was Pugnacious. It was something Pigs. <laughs> pugnacious will work for now. But it was something, Perturbed. Yes, it was Perturbed Pigs. And the subtitle was, Revenge is a dish best served cold, which, as we know, is a Klingon proverb. Okay, it's Shakespeare. But you've got to read the original Shakespeare in Klingon in order to get the full meaning. Anyway, the point is, whether it's pugnacious or precipitous or prickly, <laughs> pigs, whatever. They're pigs, and they're in space, and they're fighting birds. And it's a game. <laughs> he said, no. What are you going to do? I try to make him a billion de billion de dollars and he says, no. So anyway, Klingon pigs in space, even better. So, but one of you out there watching this show will run with it and make 11 de billion de dollars, whatever. If you do, here's the thing. If you do, go to my website and click on the donate button. It says at the very top, money, with an exclamation point. Hit that button and send me some money through PayPal. As a matter of fact, even if you don't make the game and make $11 billion, do that anyway. Dude, it will keep me in game, not games, device type coolness like my pad here. What is this? This Sonic G tablet. Yes. And so, in order to buy these things and play with them and tell you about them and 
so forth. I've got to have some moolah. So send some. I'm sure you're all chomping at the bit to do so. Whoa! <laughs> Geek Software of the Week drumroll said, Dude, I'm stopping you while you're ahead or behind or whatever. I don't blame it. This week is not even the Geek Software of the Week per se. It's the Geek Website of the Week. Geek Website of the Week this week is Tweak Now. Yes, tweaknow.com, where you can get some cool free software. See, it's like kind of like double your money kind of savings here. You can get Tweak Now Reg Cleaner to clean your registry. You can get Tweak Now Win Secret. You can get Tweak Now Power Pack. You get the idea. You can even get Macish stuff. Uh, OS X Lion Secrets. Free RAM Booster. Tweak Now Secure Delete. They also have a tips page where they have all kinds of cool tips. Anyway, the website is tweaknow.com. I'll put it right up here on the screen. Tweaknow.com. Cool stuff! So it's the Geek Website of the Week, so you can go there and learn things. We always try to keep our brains charged, fully charged. <laughs> That's why I have these electrodes that they put on my head and zap me. I think that's what it's for. <laughs> then again, maybe not. But anyway, it keeps me on my toes, I'm telling you. Particularly if you stand in water. Don't do that! Don't try that at home! I'm telling you. Anyway, see? <laughs> Once I was standing barefoot on a concrete floor and reached over and grabbed... I didn't realize it was hot, but it was a wire and... It kind of... <laughs> it's one of those things where you couldn't let go of it. That's a freaky feeling. So, don't do that. <laughs> anyway, I know some of you are saying, yeah, and you haven't been right since. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, the point is, there's a great many things you shouldn't do. Now, I did something just this yesterday, as a matter of... Well, was it yesterday? Yes, it was. No. The today, as I record this, it's a Sunday, which is unusual because I normally record on a Saturday. So it wasn't yesterday. It was day before yesterday. On Friday after work, I went down to High Rock Lake and went swimming. You're saying, what? Are you crazy? It's the middle of March. Yes. But it's been a very warm March. And I happened to notice on the web thing about High Rock Lake that the water temperature was 73 degrees. And I thought, that's not bad. So I'll give it a shot. It was rather cool. But it was tolerable. So I went swimming. I'm funny that way. <laughs> anyway, so I don't necessarily recommend it, but, you know, I kind of enjoyed it. Just the very... The very fact that the earliest I'd ever been swimming down at the lake was on uh, the first weekend of May. And here it is, March, and I went. I was like, dude, <laughs> tough guy, you know what I'm saying? Or crazy, one or the other. Anyway, the point is, I had a lot of fun. So there you go. And uh, I got to, oh, and I got to, recently, I built a... Um, I took my netbook, my old Acer netbook, which had Jolly Cloud on it, which, you know, I've told you about that many, 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 many netcasts ago. Well, I took that, wiped it, and put El Ubuntu on it. El Ubuntu. <laughs> That's interesting. Anyway, turns out it's an awesome distro. Dude, who knew? It's awesome. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm about this close to taking my regular work laptop, which is currently running Ubuntu, it used to be Fedora, now it's Ubuntu, I'm thinking about maybe wiping that and putting a Ubuntu on it. That's hard to say. But what it is, it uses the LDXE, I think, not 100% sure of that, but I think that's right, uh, instead of GNOME. And it just is, it's much faster because it's much lighter weight. But one thing I noticed, and this is really, really interesting, and I'm just kind of dragging on here, but anyway, 
hopefully you'll find it somewhat interesting, and that is that chrome under Linux, as you know, is called chromium. And when I had it under Fedora, and I had it under, as I do now currently under uh, Ubuntu, it didn't, you know, didn't show WebM HTML5 videos. It's just, it's like it didn't recognize it. And I'm like, that's not right, because I know that regular Chrome on Windows works fine with that. Well, turns out under El Ubuntu, <laughs> the Chromium browser does show WebM and HTML5 videos. So that's cool. I was impressed. And it just generally seems to be nicer in the way it works. I, just a little bit more Windowsy too, you know, for those that are that are, you know, not wanting to make the transition to a Linux environment and want to be a little more Windowsy. So I'm I'm kind of thinking maybe a going that way. So we'll see. But I just wanted to share that with you because I'm always geeking out and doing something odd with geekery. Oh, speaking of geekery, I'm glad you reminded me. You're sitting there going, no, I didn't remind you. I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> Geek wisdom. I'm supposed to share a new Geek wisdom with you every week. This is from the book, Geek Wisdom, The Sacred Teachings of Nerd Culture. <laughs> and you know, last week we, we talked about the uh, all your base are belong to us. I'm going to randomly let it fall open. And, oh, this is, this is an odd one. And we'll see what geek wisdom we have this week. This week, we have a quote from Robert Heinlein, who is a science fiction author, was, since has moved on to his reward, whatever that might be. And his quote here is, Specialization is for insects. Okay. Maybe if we read the write-up, it will make more sense. <laughs> it says, think about your favorite handheld device. I like handheld devices. Dollars to Donut says it doesn't just serve as a phone or a camera or an automatic coffee stirrer. It probably does a whole bunch of these things. You love it for that very reason. After all, if electronics are capable of doing so many incredible things, why shouldn't one device be able to handle them all? Robert Heinlein thought the same should apply to human beings. And he was right. Heinlein was a bootstrappy libertarian amid liberal peers decades before it became trendy. <laughs> and he took his fair share of criticism for those stringent beliefs. It's getting very hard to read. The print is so small. And he took his first... Yes, yeah, so I said that. And one thing he can't be accused of is underestimating the human ability to achieve. Excel at many things, he told us. Be capable. Be adept. Be smart and strong and focused. That is our mandate as human beings. And Heinlein stories are littered with people who show us how. We can say what we will about his views on, say, war, but few can argue against aspiring to be a well-rounded, multi-talented person. So go forth and learn to fix a bicycle, and how to understand ancient history, and how to vacuum corners. Now there's a talent. And how to calculate a number sequence. You'll be happier. <laughs> now, in the very, very, very fine print, here's what it says. I'm going to try to focus to read it. The rest of the quote from Time Enough for Love, written in 1973, is long but worth memorizing. A human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, wear, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze new problems, pitch manure, <laughs> program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, and die gallantly. What? Anyway, he was an overachiever. <laughs> so, there you go. Geek wisdom for you. So ponder that. And perhaps it will change your life. It is the sacred writings of nerd wisdom. So, 
Anyway, remember until next time that the doctor is out of here. Dr. Bill the Computer Curmudgeon is a production of DrBillBailey.net with all the honors, rights, and privileges thereunto appertaining.